Oh my god, it's you, and it's me, and we're back for some more... YouTube exclusive content. YouTube exclusive content! So I went and got myself in some TikTok drama. And this isn't the first time I've been involved in TikTok drama, but this is the most recent time. And it's getting... Kind of gnarly over there. It's getting kind of spicy. Like, I'm not sure what's going to happen still. It's not resolved, I don't think. And I'm going to let you know right up top, just so that you're informed, in order to really get into this, we're going to have to watch a handful of TikTok videos. It's going to be okay, I promise. I'm going to be here the whole time. We're going to watch them together, and it's going to be real fun. But the whole thing started when Jason Aldean released a super racist song called Call That in a Small Town. Try that in a small town See how far you make it down the road And you can go Google the lyrics to the song or listen to the song or watch the music video for the song if you want. That's fine. I don't really care. Feel free to do your own research, as it were. But the song is really racist. And I'm not gonna spend too much time in this video breaking down all of the evidence for that and explaining exactly why or how it's racist. I will be linking several really, really good videos by other creators that I think did a really good job of that in the description, so you can watch those if you would like. But I will say really quickly that it's not just like one thing or just like a vibe that some people are picking up on. There are a lot of reasons why people are saying this song is racist from the imagery in the lyrics to the imagery in the music video. There's a lyric in this song where he says, good old boys raised up right. And honestly, if there were nothing else in the song, that would be enough for me to say that's a racist song. If you write a country song that's about like people you don't like coming to visit your small town and there's a lyric that talks about good old boys raised right, that's a racist song. I'm sorry, that's just the rules. What we're focusing on in this video is the drama that I got myself wrapped up in. That's why you're here, right? That's why you clicked on the video, because you want that drama, you little drama kings and queens. And what is a non-binary version of a king or a queen? Just you, you little drama royal person. You're a little dramatic royal person, aren't you? You came in here to get that drama, you little non-binary royal person person. So for me, it really all started with this. All right, somebody tagged me in this video about this new Jason Aldean song that's like got a bunch of racial undertones in it that are pretty obvious and pretty overt. And uh, yeah, let, let's do it. Obvious caveat up front. I'm a white guy responding to a black content creator about a racial issue, but I have a hunch that most black people are going to agree with me, so let's let her rip. So are we going to talk about the racist dog whistles in Jason Aldean's new song? No, we're not going to talk about any of the racist dog whistles because there are none. He didn't mention race one time in the entire song. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I want to just say right here. This was my very first introduction to a content creator named Jeff Mead, who is uh, a black man, as you can see, and a conservative who spends his time peddling conservative talking points, but mostly just critiquing the black community and sort of pushing white supremacist propaganda and anti-black rhetoric. The majority of the people in your comment section are racist white people who say things like, well, if he had just complied with the police and think that black on black crime is a thing. Surely you're not saying that it's racist when people think that individuals should comply with the police instead of fighting them. And I hope you're not saying people are racist if they can acknowledge that black on black crime does exist. So obviously Jeff was getting involved and saying, no, this song isn't racist. You guys are all just overreacting. Well, for one, you're having racial hallucinations, which I call hallucinations. But anyway, I'll let TikTok Austin keep talking now. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and give you the benefit of the doubt and pretend for the sake of this video that 
you don't know what a dog whistle is. For the record, I don't actually believe that. I don't actually believe that you don't know what a dog whistle is, but for the sake of this video, I'll go along with your premise here and just pretend that you don't know. A dog whistle in the real world, literally, is a whistle that dog trainers use that emits a frequency that only dogs can hear. So a racial dog whistle is when racists use language that is designed in a specific way to only be heard by other racists. They're not saying overtly racist things out loud, they're saying it in- I'm really happy with this video. You know, I have to be very economic with my words when it comes to making TikTok videos. I really have to decide what's gonna go in the video and what's not gonna go in the video. I have to like decide to focus on something that I want to talk about as my primary topic. I can't really have too many different topics. I really have to sort of focus in on one thing and I chose for this video, obviously, to focus in on explaining what dog whistles are and how they work in media and art. And while I do think that it is accurate what I just said about racial dog whistles being a way for racists to say things that only other racists can hear, I wish I had carved out the time in this video or any of the other videos that I did on this topic to talk about the fact that like another major reason people use racial dog whistles is so that they can maintain plausible deniability. A huge benefit of dog whistling is that you can just disingenuously go, that's not what I said. That's not what I explicitly said. I don't know where you're getting this idea that I'm saying all of this stuff under the surface. I didn't explicitly say any of that stuff. You're crazy. Or I didn't explicitly say any of that stuff. You must actually be the thing that you're accusing me of being if you're the one who's hearing all of these secret messages. And plenty of conservative content creators like Jeff, but not limited to Jeff, were more than happy to employ this tool of plausible deniability. The only problem is racists aren't nearly as clever or intelligent as they think they are, and we all know what they're saying when they use these silly dog whistles. So for your assessment of the song to be, there are no racial dog whistles in this song, he doesn't even mention race. It's like, yeah, man, that's what a racial dog whistle is. He wouldn't mention race specifically if he was dog whistling. So like, for example, if I were to write a song where I was saying that Hollywood elites are conspiring to create a new world order. Some people might call that song anti-Semitic and say that I'm using anti-Semitic tropes and dog whistles. So just a little note here, a lot of people in the comments on TikTok were confused as to why Hollywood elites and New World Order would be considered anti-Semitic imagery. Just if you're not aware, a very old and very well-worn anti-Semitic trope and conspiracy theory is the idea that a secret cabal of very powerful Jews is conspiring to create a New World Order. Pretty much any time you hear someone talking about the New World Order, that conspiracy theory in particular has its roots in anti-Semitism. The person that you're listening to who's talking about this conspiracy to create the New World Order may or may not be aware of the anti-Semitic roots of that particular conspiracy theory, but that conspiracy theory does have its roots in anti-Semitic propaganda. And the other thing, the thing about Hollywood elites, well, you know, whenever you hear a right-wing conspiracy theorist talk about globalists or Hollywood elites, usually that's a pretty good sign that they're speaking in code for Jewish people. They believe that Jewish people run Hollywood. They believe that Jewish people are globalists. So this is sort of a way to dog whistle and speak in code about Jewish people. There's a part of the music video for this Jason Aldean song that he filmed in front of a courthouse that was the site of a famous lynching. That's like if I filmed part of the music video for my secret anti-Semitic song at like Auschwitz. And then I was just like, don't worry about it. That doesn't mean anything. That's not anything you're supposed to read into in any way. Like, dude. <laughs>
I do want to play one quick clip here of an argument that Jeff Mead made uh, to debunk this whole idea that Jason Aldean filming in front of this courthouse was signaling anything in any way. So now people are saying, well, the courthouse, the courthouse, a black kid was lynched there in 1927. Okay, for one, that was almost 100 years ago. Is it okay that they did that to him? Absolutely not, but that's not the point of this conversation. So, okay, that happened about 100 years ago. That is one thing that happened there. You think that's the only thing that's ever happened there in the history of existence of this building? Okay, yeah. So Jeff does this thing a lot that's like really kind of charming. He concedes a lot of points that the people who are responding to him are making, especially the arguments that like he knows are valid. But then he'll just move right on and continue peddling bullshit, nonsense, terrible arguments. Like this whole rebuttal that Jeff makes about the courthouse would potentially be interesting if the courthouse were the only thing associated with the song that was making people say, I think this song is kind of racist. Like, let's say that we were doing a murder trial and the defendant who was on trial for the murder just had a whole bunch of evidence against him and it really didn't look good for him. Let's say that, uh, you know, the victims were killed with a knife and that the knife was found in the defendant's possession, his fingerprints were on the knife, the knife was matched to the victims, their blood was on the knife, several eyewitnesses saw the defendant around the crime scene, around the time that it took place. And then let's say that on top of that, the defendant revisited the scene of the crime a few days later and was photographed there. If Jeff Mead was the defense attorney, he'd be like, what, you have a photo of my client at this place? I'm sure millions of people have taken photos at this place over the years. I'm sure there's so many more people who have taken photos at this place. So many more things have happened at this place than just my client walking by and being photographed at this place one time. It's like, yeah, Jeff, if the photo was the only piece of evidence that we had, then you might have a good point. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt here, but I do want you to know that me giving you the benefit of the doubt in this instance means that I'm assuming you have just abysmal media comprehension skills. But yeah, so let's run with that. You have no idea how to fucking interpret media, so let's help you out here to interpret this Jason Aldean song. He talks about crime and how it's wrong. He also talks about burning the American flag, talks about spitting in cops' face. Everything I just listed before this, not spitting in cops' face, not robbing, not looting, not burning the flag, those are all common, decent things people with morals don't do. According to Fucking who? According to who is burning a flag just automatically a thing that decent moral people don't do? You just say that as though we should all understand what you mean by that and definitely agree. Am I not allowed to burn a Nazi flag? Is that not a decent or moral thing to do? And if I'm angry with my country and I feel like the government of my country is not acting in my best interest, if I feel like my country is empowering fascistic authoritarian regimes like the American police force to just brutalize me and my community with impunity, yeah, maybe as a form of expressing my frustration with that, I might burn a flag or two. But let's talk about these lyrics about rioting and looting. And again, this is in the interest of giving you a good faith media comprehension 101 class. When conservative politicians and conservative media talking heads talk about people rioting and looting, which context are they most often talking about that in? And who are they most often talking about? I'm gonna just go ahead and give you the answer. The context that they most often talk about that in is when they're talking about Black Lives Matter protests and the people they're most often talking about are black people. And Jason Aldean knows that, even if you don't, but I think you do. You know, that's the other thing about this Jason Aldean song is it's like, incredibly un-American. Take the racism thing out of the equation. Jason Aldean's basically saying that he doesn't want people who have ideological differences from him coming into his town 
and demonstrating their beliefs. I saw a lot of apologists in my comments and in different comments on different videos saying things like, he's not talking about black people, he's talking about white Antifa liberals. And it's like, okay, even if he's talking about white Antifa liberals, they have a First Amendment right to burn flags. They have a First Amendment right to peacefully assemble and to protest. Like, again, removing the racism from the equation, there are massive legal questions in this weird Jason Aldean song. It really feels like Jason Aldean is advocating for vigilantism. It really feels like Jason Aldean is more or less saying, if you find yourself in the wrong southern town and you have the wrong idea, identity or the wrong beliefs, we might kill you. <laughs> you know what? Now you're gonna pay, baby. Anyway, that is legitimately the only video I thought I was going to make on this topic. So I went and saw the movie Barbie, and I turned my phone off, and when I turned my phone on at the end of the movie, I saw this. All right, so I made a couple of videos on this topic with Jason Aldean, a bunch of people have responded and some people disagree with me, as expected. But here's what I find interesting. A bunch of these people, hey, it's dog whistles, dog whistles, dog whistles. So this man was giving me a lesson on what dog whistles are. So a racial dog whistle is when racists use language that is designed in a specific way to only be heard by other racists. Okay, fair point, and agreed. You see that thing there? You see what Jeff just did there? Okay, fair point, and agreed. That's that thing. That's that thing that I'm talking about, that he's good at. And I'm gonna be completely honest, it is kinda charming. When I first watched this video and I heard him do that, okay, okay fair, fair point, point, and, and agreed. agreed. It instantly disarmed me. I instantly was like, damn, I might have misjudged this guy. Right away, just that little thing. Okay, okay fair, fair point, point, and agreed. agreed. I was like, damn, he's admitting that he was wrong about what dog whistles are and that he learned something from watching my video. That's pretty cool of him. And he didn't sound sarcastic or anything like that. All of these thoughts I had in a millisecond, the millisecond between him saying that, okay, fair point, and agreed, and him saying the next part. Now, here's what I find extremely interesting about that. If that's the case, why are so many people on the right not hearing the whistle and so many people on the left hearing the whistle? It's so funny that the whistle so many of you guys proclaim that was meant to be heard by a bunch of people on the right and racist people. So many people are not hearing that whistle, but so many people on the left seem to hear that whistle. All right, that's enough of that. Um, you get the point. And I'll tell you, my first thought was, ooh. Ooh, I really don't like this guy and I'm kind of glad that the bad vibes that I was getting off of him were just confirmed But then I realized something the whole argument that he's making in this video where he's responding to me is essentially Well, if dog whistles exist and they are in the song and remember Jeff did agree that he was wrong about dog whistles Okay, fair point and agreed then why are only people on the left hearing those dog whistles. And that's only an argument that Jeff could be making in good faith if he only watched the part of my video that he clipped. Because if you'll remember, in that video, I went on to say this. They're not saying overtly racist things out loud. They're saying it in code so that it can be understood by only the people they want to understand it. The only problem is, Racists aren't nearly as clever or intelligent as they think they are, and we all know what they're saying when they use these silly dog whistles. So his whole argument is, if a dog whistle is something that only a racist can hear, how come you can hear it? That's the argument that he's presenting to his audience. But I just explained it, right there, in that video. I had already suspected that Jeff was a grifter who intentionally misrepresents information to craft narratives for his audience, but this was a smoking gun. This was it, this was the proof. He knew that my video provided additional context as to why anti-racist people on the left might be able to identify racial dog whistles. I had to make a response video Obviously, I had to. The only dark I like is when I turn off the lights. The only hood I love is pointy and white. Can't trust you if I can't see your face at night. I think we all know who we're talking about. Wait, hey, wait, hey, stop that. That's racist. What's what? What is racist about it? The only hood I love is pointy and white. Let's talk about the Klan, man. The Ku Klux Klan? 
Are you outside of your mind? Jordan Peele's character is picking up on the obvious dog whistles in Keegan's songs. Not because Jordan's the actual racist, but because Jordan's the only one in the room who's being intellectually honest. Keegan's character is using the flimsy argument that because the lyrics in the songs he's singing don't explicitly say anything about race, the song can't be racist. And where else have I heard someone make that boneheaded argument? No, we're not going to talk about any of the racist dog whistles because there are none. He didn't mention race one time in the entire song. Oh yeah, that's right. It was you. It was you, Jeff, you grifter, you little grifty McGrifterson, you griftiest dude on the grifter net. It honestly is so amazing how well that Kim Peel sketch represents this entire Jason Aldean controversy. There's another part in that sketch where they talk about homies. Oh, pretty racist song. <laughs> <laughs> racist against who? Oh, black people. Black people? But I'm black. <laughs> well, keeping the red-headed girl away from the homies on the wrong side of town. Homies? Come on, brother, there's all kinds of homies. You know, you white homies, Asian homies. No, homies are black. No, I think you're making them black, man. I mean, that, I think that's your stuff. And I love this because I mentioned the lyrical imagery earlier of good old boys raised right. And there's been all of this bad faith discourse from right wing commentators and commenters saying things like good old boys aren't necessarily white. You're making them white. And it's just literally that exact part from the Key and Peele sketch. It's like, no. They're white. But anyway, that's essentially the debate between Jeff and myself over whether this song was racist. That's all just the prelude to the, the drama. drama. So now we're going to go into intermission. And in chapter two, we're going to talk more about the, the drama. drama. Hey, welcome back from the break. Did you get a little pee-pee? Did you go a little pee-pee? Maybe a little poop? If so, that was very fast because that was only like 10 seconds. But it's been a really long time for me. It's been like 10 days for me since I recorded the first part of the video. It, it, I'm a whole different person now. Anyway, let's just recap a little bit shall we? Jason Aldean releases this racist song. Some people on the internet talk about how the song is racist. A bunch of conservative content creators and talking heads respond and say that the song isn't racist because they have to do that. That's just what they do. Somebody tags me in one of those videos made by a conservative content creator named Jeff Mead. In that video, he says that he doesn't think that the song has any dog whistles in it because the song says nothing explicitly about race prompting me to make my first response video where I educate Jeff on what dog whistles are. Jeff responds to me saying, cool, if dog whistles exist and are in the song, then how come only the people on the left are hearing them, implying that the people on the left are the real racists? So I make another response video to Jeff pointing out that Anti-racist people are aware of what dog whistles are and are able to recognize them when they see them. It doesn't mean that they're racist. It just means that they're being intellectually honest about the subject matter of whatever it is that has the dog whistles in it. And that more or less gets us caught up. But there's a part to my second response video to Jeff that I didn't show you in the first half of this video. And it's sort of the critical part of that video because it is the part that created all of the drama. See, the thing that really stuck in my craw, the thing that really ground my gears, the thing that really cooked my bacon in Jeff's response video to me is the way that he clipped me out of context so that he could make his point about how come only people on the left are hearing the dog whistles if the dog whistles exist. And it bothered me because the video that he was clipping had me explaining why it was that people on the left might be able to recognize those dog whistles. If he had just 
played the entire clip for his audience, then his argument that he wanted to make would no longer have made any sense. But he left out the full context of the clip so that he could make that bad faith disingenuous argument and continue crafting the narrative that his audience wanted to see. And not only did that really bother me, but it also gave me an idea. Because here's the thing about content creators like Jeff and the people who consume their content. They don't really care about telling the truth or being intellectually honest. And they definitely don't care about having the better argument that's based on the better data and the better logic and the better facts. All they really care about at the end of the day is being ideologically opposed to the left at all costs. If it's raining outside and people on the left are saying, we gotta do something about this rain, people on the right will find a way to say, it's not raining. And for the content creators who are pushing the message and the audience who is consuming the message, the truth of whether or not it's raining doesn't really matter. All that matters is that they're able to come up with sound bites that present the illusion of winning. So I had this idea, I thought, I wonder if I could get Jeff to show the full clip from my original video where I explain why anti-racist people on the left might be able to hear and recognize dog whistles to his audience. And my hypothesis was that not only would I be able to get him to do that, but also his audience wouldn't care. And so in my second response video to Jeff, I had a section where I said this. What's the rest of that clip, Jeff? The part that you clipped out. The part that you didn't show your audience. Jeff, what's the rest of it? Jeff, I dare you. I dare you to show that clip to your audience. I double dare you. I triple dog dare you, Jeff. No, seriously, Jeff, I'm being serious. I will pay you. $1,000. I will Venmo, Zelle, or PayPal you $1,000 if you show your audience the rest of that clip. I gotta be honest. I went back and forth a lot over whether or not the double dog dare would be enough. But I really wanted to make sure that Jeff would do it, and I felt like offering money would be A, a good way to make sure it would happen, and B, a good way to show that a person like Jeff Mead would have no problem essentially telling his audience that he lied to them if there was money in it for him. After all, like, that's why these people do this, right? That's why the Ben Shapiros and the Steven Crowders and the Matt Walshes and the Candace Owenses and the Blair Whites of the world do what they do. They do it because their livelihood depends on it. That is how they get their bag. That is how they get paid. And also, again, I hypothesized that Jeff's audience would not care if Jeff told them, hey, look, I did clip this guy out of context so I could make this bad faith disingenuous argument, but he bet me $1,000 that I wouldn't show you guys the full clip, but here it is, and now he has to pay me $1,000, that stupid lib. And anyway, long story short, that's exactly how it played out. As you wish and make sure that you weren't taking me out of context. But if you had just continued to play the clip that you showed them, they would have seen this. They're not saying overtly racist things out loud. They're saying it in code so that it can be understood by only the people they want to understand it. The only problem is racists aren't nearly as clever or intelligent as they think they are. And we all know what they're saying when they use these silly dog whistles. So what I'm saying there is, yeah, racists employ a tactic called dog whistling. You've already seen this part. It's in the first half of the video, but essentially, yeah, he went on to play the rest of the clip for his audience. And predictably, they didn't care. And this is where the little plan that I wanted to hatch kind of came to fruition. I had Jeff right where I thought I wanted him. He did the thing I wanted him to do, 
and his audience reacted the way I wanted them to react. And now it was time for me to spring the trap, as it were, to reveal the final twist in this stunt I was trying to pull. Essentially, I was trying to pull an Ocean's 13. You know how in that movie, Danny and the gang have to team up with Terry Benedict, played by Andy Garcia, and he's the bad guy from the first movie, but now they have to team up with him so that they can take down the bad guy in the third movie, who's played by Al Pacino, and they tell Terry Benedict that at the end of the heist, they're going to give him half of whatever they steal from Al Pacino, but then in the final act, they reveal that it was all a double cross, and they donate Terry's portion of the take to charity, and so now Terry's kind of stuck looking like a jackass because he either has to go to those charities and ask for the money back, or just accept the fact that Danny and the boys pulled one over on him. Now you know that wasn't our deal. Well, if you feel that strongly about it, then we'll yank the kids out of the camp and we'll send them back to their foster homes. All 200 of them. You think this is funny? Well, Terry, it sure as shit ain't sad. Well, yeah, that's essentially what I did to Jeff, and that was my plan all along. I didn't offer Jeff $1,000 because I thought he wouldn't do it. I made that offer hoping he would do it. Because this allows me to say something about conservatives and conservative ideology that I think needs to be said. And that is that conservatives don't care in general about truth and honesty and strong arguments that hold up to scrutiny. What conservative ideology values more than anything else is winning. And to conservatives, part of winning is being ideologically opposed to the left no matter what. If you wear a mask, I don't wear a mask. If you like this movie, I hate this movie. Conservative politicians and media personalities tell their base that they're lying to them all the time, and these people don't care. I didn't think that Jeff was gonna show them the full context of my clip and then all of his followers were gonna go, oh my God, we've been duped. Consider the Dominion lawsuit at Fox News. Just so many text messages of massively popular conservative media personalities admitting that they lie to their audience all the time and nobody cared. Donald Trump telling conservative voters as far back as 2015 that if he ever lost an election, he would just say that the other side cheated. Saying that before it ever happened, before any possible evidence could have even existed. And conservatives did not and do not care. Conservatives don't hire Kyle Rittenhouse to speak at massive events and rallies because he's such an amazing public speaker or he's this incredible mind that everyone wants to learn from. No, they hire Kyle Rittenhouse because they know it makes us mad. And making us mad is part of winning for them. I just wanna pause here really quick and zoom in on the graph that I pulled up in the TikTok video because I think it really does deserve its own little bit of recognition. This is a graph from a study that CBS News did where they asked Republican voters what's important to them in a candidate. And you can see that there were several ridiculous things that people responded were important to them in considering a candidate, like a candidate who supports the big lie that Donald Trump won the 2020 election, a candidate who is backed by Donald Trump. But the most insane one, in my view, is that over 50% of Republicans who were polled and close to 60% of Republicans who vote said that what's important to them is a candidate who makes liberals angry. That's right. It's not a candidate who aims to fix our broken healthcare system or our crumbling economic framework, just a candidate who makes people on the left mad. I mean, yeah, okay, back to the video. But anyway, I am a man of my word, Jeff, so I'm gonna make good on my deal. But I do have to admit, there's a little bit of a catch. See, I just didn't feel like I could trust you to do the right thing with the money. So I went ahead and donated, or should I say we donated $1,000 to different charities. I donated $500 to the Sentencing Project, $250 to the Black Lives Matter Global Network, and $250 to Black Girls Smile, an organization that supports, amongst other things, mental health for black women. And I made all of those donations in your name. What an absolute pleasure doing business with you. Bye, Jeff.
Idiotic nonsense, feeling like a fountain overflow with no one knowing. So like, that's pretty fun, right? And I gotta admit, when I made that video, I was feeling pretty good about how well that plan came together and was executed. My conscience felt pretty clean. I said I was gonna pay a thousand dollars to do this stunt, and even though I was lying to Jeff about the money going directly to him, I did pay that thousand dollars and I gave it to causes that I thought were good causes to give it to. And I definitely was expecting a certain amount of backlash from Jeff and his audience, but I don't think I was ready for quite how insanely upset these people were going to be. It's been like 10 straight days of just thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these insanely butthurt people from Jeff Mead's audience demanding that I pay him his money, calling me the real racist. This is just typical liberal white guy racist stuff. You aren't a man of your word. They're just like foaming at the mouth with how upset they are. And I'll be honest, like, I don't really care about that. I don't really care that people in Jeff Mead's audience are really mad about this. I think it sort of further proves the point that I was trying to make. None of those people actually care about what started this whole thing. They don't actually care about who made better arguments about whether or not Jason Aldean's song was racist. They don't care about whether or not Jeff effectively won that debate. And that's why they didn't care that Jeff had to show them that he was lying to them in order to win that thousand dollars. That doesn't matter. What they wanted, the end result that would have been satisfying to them, that would have felt like winning to them, is me having to pay Jeff directly $1,000. And since I deprived them of that result, they lost their collective minds. And essentially what I was doing to them is just what they do to everyone else all the time. I was trolling the trolls. I was grifting the grifters. I was lying to the liars. I was scamming the scammers. And it's genuinely driving them to madness. Oh, 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 that is so unfair, I hate you! And again, like, I'm all right with that. That part of it is honestly kind of fun. But there has been an unforeseen consequence to this that I don't think I anticipated when I first came up with this whole scheme. And that is that a small but vocal portion of my audience was actually pretty disappointed by the tactic that I used to pull this one over on Jeff. They felt like me doing this, me not making good on this bet, was me sinking to Jeff Mead's level. It was me showing that my word isn't as strong as they thought it was. It was me doing damage to my integrity and harming my reputation in their eyes. Now, Jeff has made videos insinuating that it's massive swaths of my audience that are turning on me. You had a fair amount of your own followers low-key calling you out on this because some of them do have integrity and care about integrity. And that's just not true. The overwhelming majority of people in my audience who saw the way that this whole thing played out were totally fine with it and actually excited by it and thought that it was pretty fun and funny. But there were probably like 200, maybe even 500 people in my audience who felt like Lying's bad, and I shouldn't have lied. And you know, there is a little part of me that feels like this is kind of a moral absolutist take that isn't very realistic. It kind of reminds me of that Chris Farley SNL sketch from the 90s. What? You son of a bitch. Or that time that Kyle Scheel got canceled for doing a prank video where he put a cardboard cutout of himself in a Flying J and it turned out that it was actually a paid partnership with the Flying J. When people found out, they were like, he lied to us! As though 90% of prank videos on the internet aren't fake anyway. Hi, sweetheart. Oh, so we're talking now? 
What do you mean now? When were we fighting? Nothing's happened. I was... What? Yeah. You're not mad at me? I'm so confused! Am I mad at you? Who's mad at who? So real. So lifelike. It just sort of felt like people were dealing with this moral framework where lying equals bad, Austin told a lie, therefore Austin equals bad. It felt like people weren't really using context to figure out whether or not this was the kind of lie that is harmful on a large scale or whether it's the kind of lie that someone's reputation maybe can't recover from. But I don't know. It did get me thinking about the fact that like a lot of people follow me because they feel like I do my best to argue in an honest way and I do my best to support positions because I feel like those positions have data behind them that supports them and because I feel like I'm telling the truth when I advocate for those positions. I started thinking, should I actually pay Jeff the money just so that I can avoid sinking to his level and make sure that I'm staying on a moral high ground? But I don't know. I don't know if I buy the idea that me telling one lie to Jeff Mead one time to make a point puts me on the same moral level as all the other conservative commentators on the internet who spread harmful misinformation and lies on a daily basis just to fuel a nonsense culture war. It kind of reminds me of this video by my friend Stanzi Potenza. Well, it seems like Mitch McConnell had a stroke while he was giving a speech. Yeah, the uh, streets are calling him Glitch McConnell. That's not funny. It's not supposed to be nice. Yeah, but if we make fun of him for having health issues, then we're just as bad as the conservatives. No, I still think I'm better than conservatives. Look, I understand having empathy, right? I'm not a monster. But personally, I don't want to empathize with oppressors. Yeah, but he's still human. I mean, yeah, technically, sure, but, um... But so was Hitler. And if I had Twitter in the 1940s, I wouldn't be like, hey guys, I know he committed genocide, but we shouldn't be cheering for his death. Come on. He's still just a guy. He's a little baby. Like what she's talking about there is very similar to all of the people who are making jokes when the Titan submarine imploded. Because like, yeah, making fun of people who died isn't cool. Making fun of people who are dealing with neurological conditions isn't cool. And like punching people isn't cool. Lying to people isn't cool. But context matters, right? Like I might not punch a Nazi in the face, but I'm definitely not going to say that if you punch a Nazi in the face, that makes you just as bad as a Nazi. Unless you're also a Nazi. If you're just like one Nazi punching another Nazi in the face, then I guess, yeah, you're both bad Nazis. But if you punch a Nazi in the face because you're a person whose entire ideology is in stark, vitriolic, adamant opposition to white nationalism, then yeah, I don't think you're as bad as that Nazi just because you punched them. So I don't really think that paying Jeff somehow gets me back into the moral high ground. I don't actually think I ever really lost the moral high ground. And I definitely believe that paying Jeff Mead a thousand dollars is worse than lying to Jeff Mead. All that being said, there does have to be some form of accountability here. And I think where I'm currently at as a content creator is that the cost of this stunt for me is that A, I did actually wind up paying $1,000. It did cost me $1,000. I just gave that money to organizations that I thought would make better use of it than Jeff Mead would. But also B, there are going to be some people who used to go to me as a voice for truth and reason and well-articulated arguments who maybe won't trust me as much anymore or who maybe will just sort of think differently of me. And I think that all of those people are entitled to that experience. I think that that is valid. And I think the cost is that I have to let that happen. I have to be willing to take that hit to my reputation. I have to be willing to take that hit to my perceived integrity. And also I have to deal with just like thousands and thousands and thousands of really obnoxious people in Jeff Mead's audience and 
Trust me, that is not nothing. I just want to take one more quick moment here to recognize one of my absolute favorite comments I got from one of these American flag hat wearing smooth brains in Jeff Mead's audience. This is from Ryan Arco, who commented, My concern is that Austin Archer has shown a long established disdain for black creators specifically. Now, I have been responding to conservative content creators full time for quite some time. I've been making these videos for over three years straight now, and I have responded to a lot of people. I went back and did a deep dive and found that Jeff Mead is the first black conservative that I have ever responded to. All of the other people that I've responded to over the last three years have all been white. Probably has something to do with the Republican Party being 89% white. I don't know, but I just do think it is worth mentioning that this is the playbook for people like Jeff and the people in his audience like Ryan Arco. They're just making shit up. Ryan Arco just went into my comment section and just said this apropos of nothing with no receipts and no evidence. Classic. Love it. Back to the video. But at the end of the day, what I can say is this simply was not my best work. It was just kind of sloppy. I just think I could have handled the whole situation better. I really don't think that the whole bet was even necessary to make the point I was trying to make. There are just better, cleaner ways I could have said what I wanted to say. And as a content creator who does this professionally full time, I want to set a higher standard for myself when making content. I want to be better than this. I want to have better execution than that. And I feel like I fell short of my personal standard a little bit here. And I guess I just wanted to make this video to say, that's the drama. That's what happened. It's still sort of ongoing. I don't know. Maybe Jeff will try to take me to small claims court over the thousand dollars that I said I would pay him. Who knows? And really, I just want to make this video to let people in my audience know that I'm aware it wasn't my best work, and if I had it to do over again, I'd probably do it differently. But God, I'm definitely not going to let myself be lectured to about morality or integrity by people who think that Donald Trump is a good person. So to all of Jeff's butthurt fans who are no doubt going to show up in the comments of this video, I offer you a heartfelt get wrecked and suck it. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Idiotic nonsense, feeling like a fountain overflow With no one knowing the difference between wrong and right All day and all damn night I got morons on my left and more on my right An overwhelming indicator, mind and methodologies Invented by the church of bigotry and insecurities It's in every bad boy, national disorder But he can be a hero with a big enough gun